Hare Krishna. We'll start tonight's reading. Okay. Om Gyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasman Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Parakamalam Shri Gurun Vaisnavamscha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvetam Savadutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padam, Sahagana Lalita, Shri Visakam Vitamscha. He Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandu Jagatpati, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Nimostite, Tapta Kancha Gorangi, Radhe Vrinda Vineshwari, Rishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Pancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha, Patita nam pavanebhyo, Vaishnavebhyo namo namaha. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Namaho Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prastaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swaminiti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Devi, Puravani Pacharine, Nirvise Sasundavari, Pastachari Zatarine. Shilaparapad Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So we're starting chapter 18 breaking ground. So uh, if anyone wants to start reading, please go for it. Or uh, if no one takes up the mantle, then we can also read. Maha Mantra Prabhu, Haribol. Sorry. <laughs> uh, breaking ground. <clears throat> Swami Bhaktivedanta came to the USA and went swiftly to the archetype spiritual neighborhood, the, lower, the New York Lower East Side, and installed intact an ancient, perfectly preserved piece of street India. He adorned the storefront as his ashram and adored Krishna therein, and by patience and good humor, singing, chanting, and expounding Sanskrit terminology day by day, established Krishna consciousness in the psychedelic mind manifesting center of America East. To choose to attend to the Lower East Side, what kindness and humility and intelligence. Allen Ginsberg from his introduction to the Macmillan Bhagavad Gita as it is. Prabhupada's new neighborhood was not as run down as the nearby Bowery, though it certainly was less than quaint. Right across from his storefront, a row of tombstones looked out from the sombre, dimly lit display windows of Weizner Brothers and Papa Memorials. North of Weizner Brothers was Sam's Luncheonette. Next to Sam's stood an ancient four-story building marked AIR. Then Ben J. Her Horowitz Monuments, more gravestones. Then finally Schwartz's funeral home. On the next block at number 43, a worn canvas awning jutted out onto the sidewalk. Provenzano Lanza Funeral Home. Then there was Cosmos Parcels Importers, and a few blocks further uptown, the prominent black and white signboard of the Village East Theatre. Up a block, but on the same side of the avenue as the storefront, was the Church of the Nativity, an old three story building with new blue paint and a gold coloured cross on top. The six story 26 Second Avenue its face covered by a greenish fire escape, 
crouched against the massive nine-story Knickerbocker fireproof warehouse. Second, Second Avenue was a main traffic artery for East Manhattan, and the stoplight at the intersection of Houston and Second pumped a stream of delivery trucks, taxis, and private autos past Bradford's door. From early morning until night, there would be cars zooming by, followed by the sound of brakes, the competitive tension of waiting bumper to bumper, the impetuous honking, then gre and gears grinding, engines rumbling and revving, and again, and again the zooming by. The traffic was distractingly heavy. At 26 Second Avenue, there were actually two storefronts. The one to the north was a coin laundry, and the one to the south had been given a bean a gift shop, but was now vacant. Both had narrow entrances, large display windows, and dull paint. Beneath the matchless gift sign was a window, six feet square, that a few weeks before had displayed matchboxes decorated with photos of movie stars of the 30s and 40s. The sign, matchless gifts, was the only remaining memento of the nostalgic gift shop that had recently moved out. Below the shop's window, a pair of iron doors on the sidewalk hid stone steps to the cellar and boiler room. The wide sidewalk had been laid down in sections of various shapes and sizes at different times years past. Certain sections had cracked or caved in, and a fine dust with tiny sparkling shards of glass had collected in the cracks and depression. A dull black fire hydrant stood on the curb. Midway between the entrances to the two storefronts was the main entrance to number 26. This door opened into a foyer lined with mailboxes and intercoms and then a locked inner door opened into a hallway leading to the stairs or back to the courtyard. To the left of the gift, to the left of the gift shop's window was its front door, a dark wooden frame holding full length pane of glass. The door opened into a long narrow storefront which was now completely bare. Just inside, to the right of the door, platform extending beneath the display window was just the proper height for a seat. At the far end of the bare, dingy room, two grimy paned windows covered with bars opened into the courtyard. To the left of the left-hand window was a small sink, fixed to the outside of a very small toilet closet, whose door faced the front of the store. The door on the store's left wall connected to a hallway that led into the courtyard. The courtyard was paved with concrete geometric sections and encircled with shrub gardens and tall trees. There was a picnic table, a cement birdbath, and a birdhouse on a pole, and near the centre of the courtyard were two shrub gardens. The courtyard was bordered north and south by high walls, and front and back by the two tenements. The patch of sky above gave relief. Overlooking the courtyard from the rear building of 26 Second Avenue was Bradford's second floor apartment, where he would now live, work and worship. With help from his Bowery friends, he had, cleaned and, he had cleaned and settled into his new home. In the back room, his office, he had placed against one wall a thin cushion with an elephant print cover, and in front of the cushion, his unpainted metal suitcase, which served as a desk. He had set his typewriter on the desk and his papers and books on either side. This became his work area. His manuscripts bundled in saffron cloth, his stock of bag of streamer bag of tans and a few personal effects he kept in the closet opposite his desk. On the wall above his sitting place, he hung an Indian calendar print of Lord Krishna. Krishna, as a youth, was playing on his flute with a cow close behind him. Lord Krishna was standing on the planet Earth, which curved like the top of a small hill beneath his feet. There were two windows on the east wall, and the dappled morning sunlight, filtering in through the fire escape, fell across the floor. Uh, anyone else want to take over? The next room was bare except for a fancy coffee table, which became Prabhupada's altar. Here he placed a framed picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates. On the wall, he hung an Indian calendar print of four round Lord Vishnu and an Antashesha, celestial snake, and as in the Bowery loft, he put up a clothesline. Both rooms were flesh, freshly painted, and the floors were clean hardwood parquet. The bathroom was clean and serviceable, 
as was the narrow furnished kitchen. Our pad was sometimes stand by the kitchen window, gazing beyond the courtyard wall. He had moved here without any prospects of paying the next month's rent. Although Carl, Mike, Carol, James, Bill and others had encouraged him to move here, some of them now found it's a little inconvenient to visit him regularly. But they all wished him well and hoped new people would come here to help him. They felt that this location was the best yet, and he seemed more comfortable here. All the paradox. At the paradox, Bill would spread the word of Swamiji's new address. The Lower East Side has a history of change and human suffering as old as New York. 300 years before Prabhupada's arrival, it had been part of Peter Stuyvesant's estate. Today's landmark of Tompkins Square Park had then been a salt marsh known as Stuyvesant Swamp. The Lower East Side first became a slum in the 1840s when thousands of Irish immigrants driven by the Irish potato famine came and settled. Two decades later, the Irish became the image of the American to the next immigrants, the Germans who gradually grew in numbers to become the largest immigrants group in New York City. Next came East European Jews, Poles and Ukrainians, and by 1900, the Lower East Side had become the most densely populated Jewish ghetto in the world. But in the next generation, the ghetto began to break up as Jews moved to the suburbs and economic advancement. Next, the Puerto Ricans thronged in hundreds of thousands in the 1950s, immigrating from their island poverty or moving in from East Harlem. They and the Negroes from Harlem and Bedford, Stuyvesant, who, who arrived next, were the new groups who, along with the Poles and Ukraines, populated the two square miles of tenements and crowded streets that formed the Lower East Side slums in the 1960s. Then, only a few years before Prabhupada's arrival, a different kind of slum dweller had appeared on the Lower East Side. Although there have been many sociological and cultural analysis of this phenomenon, it remains ultimately inexplicable why they suddenly came like a vast flock of birds swooping down or like animals in a great instinctual migration and why after a few years they vanished. At first, the newcomers were mostly young artists, musicians and intellectuals, similar to the hip crowd of Prabhupada's Bowery days. Then came the young middle class dropouts because living space was more available and rents were lower than in nearby Greenwich Village. They concentrated here on the Lower East Side, which in the parlance of the renting agents came known as East Village. Many even came without finding a place to live and camped in the hallways of tenements. Drawn by cheap rent and the promise of bohemian freedom, these young middle class dropouts, the avant-garde of a nationwide youth movement, soon to be known in the media as hippies, wandered to the Lower East Side slums in living protest against America's good life of materialism. As if responding to an instinctual call, Young teenage runaways joined the older hippies, and following the runaways came the police, counsellors, social and welfare workers, youth hostels, and drug counselling centres. On St. Mark's Place, a new hip commercialism sprang up with head shops, poster shops, record shops, art galleries, and bookstores that carried everything from cigarette papers to hip clothes and psychedelic lighting. Anyone else want to follow? I'll read. The hippies journeyed to the Lower East Side in full conviction that this was the place to be, just as their immigrant predecessors had done. For the European immigrants of another age, New York Harbour had been the gateway to a land of riches and opportunity, as they at long last set their eyes on Manhattan's skyline and the Statue of Liberty. Now, in 1966, American youth thronged to New York City with hopes of their own and feasted on the vision of their newfound mystical land, the Lower East Side slums. It was an uneasy coexistence with hippies on one side and Puerto Ricans, Poles and Ukrainians on the other. 
The established ethnic groups resented the newcomers who didn't really have to live in the slums, whereas they themselves did. In fact, many of the young newcomers were from immigrant families that had struggled for generations to establish themselves as middle-class Americans. Nevertheless, the youth migration to the Lower East Side was just as real as the migration of Puerto Ricans or Poles or Ukrainians had been, although the motives, of course, were quite different. The hippies had turned from the suburban materialism of their parents, the in inane happiness of TV and advertising, the ephemeral goals of middle-class America. They were disillusioned by parents, teachers, clergy, public figures, and the media, dissatisfied with American policy in Vietnam and allured by radical political ideologies that exposed America as a cruel, selfish, exploitative giant who must now reform or die. And they were searching for real love, real peace, real existence and real spiritual consciousness. By the summer of Srila Prabhupada's arrival at 26 Second Avenue, the first front in the Great Youth Rebellion of the 60s had already entered the Lower East Side. Here they were, free, free to live in simple poverty and express themselves through art, music, drugs and sex. The talk was of spiritual searching. LSD and marijuana were the keys, opening new realms of awareness. Notions about Eastern cultures and Eastern religions were in vogue through drugs, yoga, brotherhood, or just by being free, somehow they would attain enlightenment. Everyone was supposed to keep an open mind and develop his own cosmic philosophy by direct experience and drug expanded consciousness blended with his own eclectic readings. And if their lives appeared aimless, at least they had dropped out of a pointless game where the player sells his soul for material goods and in this way supports a system that is already rotten. So it was that in 1966, thousands of young people were walking the streets of the Lower East Side, not simply intoxicated or crazy, though they often were, but in search of life's ultimate answers, in complete disre disregard of the establishment and the day-to-day -day life pursued by millions of straight Americans. That the prosperous land of America could breed so many discontented youths, surprised Prabhupada. Of course, it also further proved that material well-being, the hallmark of American life, couldn't make people happy. Prabhupada did not see the unhappiness around him in terms of the immediate social, political, economic and cultural causes. Neither slum conditions nor youth rebellions were the all-important realities. These were mere symptoms of a universal unhappiness to which the only cure was Krishna consciousness. He sympathised with the miseries of everyone, but he saw the universal solution. Prabhupada had not made a study of the youth movement in America before moving to the Lower East Side. He had never even made specific plans to come here amid so many young people. But in the 10 months since Calcutta, he had been moved by force of circumstances, or as he understood it, by Krishna's will, from one place to another. On the order of his spiritual master, he had come to America, and by Krishna's will, he had come to the Lower East Side. His mission here was the same as it had been on the Bari or Uptown, or even in India. He was fixed in the order of his spiritual master and, and the Vedic view, a view that wasn't going to be influenced by the radical change of the 1960s. Now, if it, is, now, if it so happened that these young people because of some change in the American cultural climate, were to prove more receptive to him, th then, that, then that would be welcome. And that would also be by Krishna's will. Would anyone else like to read? Actually, because of the ominous influence of the Kali millennium, this was historical, the worst times of spiritual cultivation. Hippie evolution or not, and Srila Prabhupada was trying to transplant Vedic culture into a more alien ground than had ever been, than had any previous spiritual master. So he expected to find his work extremely difficult. 
Yeah, and this journey body is just prior to Prabhupada's arrival on the Lower East Side. Tremors of dissatisfaction and revolt against Kali Yuga culture itself began vibrating through American society, sending waves of young people to wander the streets of New York's Lower East Side in search of something beyond the ordinary life, looking for alternatives. Seeking spiritual fulfillment, these young people, broken from their stereotype materialistic backgrounds and drawn together now on New York's Lower East Side, were the ones who were by chance or choice or destiny to become the congregation for the Swami storefront offerings of kirtan and spiritual guidance. The Swami's arrival went unnoticed. The neighbors said something you had taken. Someone you had taken the gift shop neck neck the gift shop next to the laundry. There was a strange picture in the window now, but no one knew what to make of it. Some passers-by noticed a piece of paper announcing classes in Bhagavad Gita taped to the window. A few stopped to read it, but no one knew what to make of it. They didn't know what Bhagavad Gita was, and few and the few who did thought maybe a uh, yoga bookstore or something. The Puerto Ricans in the neighborhood would look in the window at the Harvey Coins painting and then boldly walk away. The manager of the mobile gas station next door couldn't care less who had moved in. It just didn't make any difference. The tombstone sellers and undertakers across the street didn't care. And for the drivers of the countless cars and trucks that passed by, Swamiji's place didn't even exist. But there were young people around who had been intrigued with the painting who, were, who went up to the window to read a little piece of paper. Some of them knew about the Bhagavad Gita, although the painting of Lord Chaitanya and the dancers didn't seem to fit. A few thought maybe they would attend Swami back to Vedanta's classes and check out the scene. July 1966. Her wheeler was hurrying from the apartment on Mott Street to her friend's apartment on Fifth Day, a quiet place where he hoped to find some peace. He walked up Mott Street to Houston, turned right and began to walk east, across Bowery, past the Russian traffic and stumbling derelicts toward Second Avenue. However, after crossing Bowery just before Second Avenue, I saw Swamiji John Fish strolling down the sidewalk his head held high in the air, his hands in his bead bag. He struck me like a famous actor in a very familiar movie. He seemed ageless. He was wearing the traditional saffron colored robes of a sannyasi and quaint white shoes with points. Coming down Houston, he looked like a genie that popped out of Aladdin's lamp. Howard, age 26, was tall, large bodied man with long black hair, a profuse beard, and black framed eyeglasses. He was an instructor in English at Ohio State University and was fresh from a trip to India where he had been looking for a guru. Prabhupada noticed her. They both stopped simultaneously. I heard asked the first question that popped into his mind. Are you from India? Prabhupada smiled. Oh, yes. And you? Howard, I told him no, but that I had just returned from India and was very interested in his country and the Hindu philosophy. He told me he had come from Kolkata and had been in New York over 10 months. His eyes were as fresh as cordial as a child's and even standing before the trucks had roared and rumbled their way down Hudson Street. He emanated a cool tranquility that was unmistakably established in something far beyond the great metropolis that roared around us. Howard never made it to his friend's place that day. He went back to his own apartment on Mott Street to Keith and Wally and his roommates to tell them that everyone he knew about, to tell everyone he knew about the guru who had inexplicably, inexplicably appeared within their midst. Keith and Howard had been to India and now they were involved in various spiritual philosophies and their friends used to come over and talk about enlightenment. 18 year old Chuck Bar Barnett was a regular visitor. Chuck, you would open the door to the apartment and thousands of cockroaches would disappear into the woodwork and the smell was enough to knock you over. 
So Keith was trying to clean their place up and kick some people out. They were sharing the rent, Wally, Keith Heard, and several others, due to lack of any other process. They were using LSD to try to increase their spiritual life. Actually, we were all trying to use drugs to help in meditation. Anyway, Wally, Howard, and Keith were trying to find the perfect spiritual master, as we all were. Howard remembers his own spiritual seeking as reading books on Eastern philosophy and religion, burning lots of candles and incense, and taking ganja and peyote and LSD as aids to meditation. Actually, it was more intoxication than meditation. Meditation was an euphorism that somehow connected our highs with our reading. Keith, 29, the son of a Southern Baptist minister, was a PhD candidate in history at Columbia University. He was preparing his thesis on the rise of revivalism in the Southern United States. Dressed in old denim cutoffs, sandals, and t-shirts, he was something of a guru among the Mott Street series. Wally was in his 30s, shabbily dressed, bearded intellectual and well-read in Buddhist literature. He had been a radio engineer in the army and like his roommates was unemployed. He was reading Alan Watts, Herman Hesse and others, talking about spiritual enlightenment and taking LSD. In India, Howard and Keith had visited Hadwa, Rishikesh, Banaras and other holy cities, experiencing Indian temples, hashish and dysentery. One evening in Calcutta, they had come upon a group of sadhus chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and playing hand symbols. For Howard and Keith, as for many Westerners, the essence of Indian philosophy was Sankara's doctrine of impersonal oneness. Everything is false except the one impersonal spirit. They had brought books that told them, whatever way you express your faith, that way is a valid spiritual path. Now the three roommates, Howard, Keith and Wally began to mix various philosophies into the hodgepodge of their own. Howard would mix a little Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau or Blake. Keith would cite biblical references and Wally would add a bit of Buddhist wisdom. And they all kept up on Timothy Leary, Thomas Akemptis and many others, the whole mixture being subject to a total reevaluation whether one of the group experienced a new cosmic insight through LSD. This was the group that Howard returned to that day in July. Excitedly, he told them about the Swami, how he looked and what he had said. Howard told how they, after they had soon, or they had stood and talked together that the Swami that had mentioned his place nearby on 2nd Avenue, where he was planning to hold some classes. Howard. I walked around the corner with him. He pointed out a small storefront building between first and second streets next door to a mobile film station. There had been a curiosity shop and someone had pointed the words matchless gift. Someone had painted the words matchless gifts over the window. At that time, I didn't realize how prophetic these words were. This is a good area, he asked me. I told him that I thought it was. I had no idea what he. I had no idea what he was going to offer at his classes. Do you want to go in? Yeah. Uh, I had no idea what he was going to offer at his classes, but I knew that all my friends would be glad that an Indian Swami was moving into the neighborhood. The word spread, although it wasn't so easy now for Carl Jurgens and certain others to come up from the Bowery in Chinatown, they had other things to do. Roy Dubois, a 25 year old writer for comic books had visited Parapad on the Bowery. When he heard about the Swami's new place, he wanted to drop by. James Green and Bill Epstein had not forgotten the Swami and they wanted to come. The Paradox restaurant was still a live connection and brought new interested people. And others like Stephen Guarino saw the, the Swami's sign in the window. Steve, aged 26, was a caseworker for the city's welfare department 
And one day on his lunch break, as he was walking home from the welfare office at Fifth Street and Second Avenue, he saw the Swami sign taped to the window. He had been reading a paperback Gita and he promised himself he would attend the Swami's class. That day, as he stood with the Swami before the storefront, Howard had also noticed a little sign in the window. Lectures in Bhagavad Gita, AC Bhaktivedanta Swami, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Will you bring your friends? Parapat had asked. Yes, Howard promised. Monday evening. The summer evening was warm and in the storefront, the back windows and front door were open wide. Young men, several of them dressed in black denims and buttoned down sports shirts with broad, dull stripes, had left their worn sneakers by the front door and were now sitting on the floor. Most of them were from the Lower East Side. No one had to go to great trouble to come here. The little room was barren. No pictures, no furniture, no rug, not even a chair. Only a few plain straw mats. A single bulb hung from the ceiling into the center of the room. It was seven o'clock and about a dozen people had gathered when the Swami suddenly opened the side door and entered the room. He wasn't wearing a shirt and the saffron cloth that draped his torso left his arms and some of his chest bare. His complexion was smooth golden brown and as they watched him, his head shaven, his ears long lobed and his aspect grave, he seemed like pictures they'd seen of the Buddha in meditation. He was old, yet erect in his posture, fresh and radiant. His forehead was decorated with the yellowish clay markings of the Vaishnavas. Parapad recognized the big bearded Howard and smiled. You have brought your friends? Yes, Howard answered in his loud, resonant voice. Ah, very good. Parapad stepped out of his white shoes sat down on a thin mat, faced his congregation, and indicated they could all be seated. He distributed several pairs of brass hand symbols and briefly demonstrated the rhythm. One, two, three. He began playing a startling, ringing sound. He began singing, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now it was the audience's turn. Chant, he told them. Some already knew. Gradually the others caught on, and after a few rounds, all were chanting together. Most of these young men and the few young women present had at one time or another embarked on the psychedelic voyage in search of a new world of expanded consciousness. Boldly and recklessly, they had entered the turbulent forbidden waters of LSD, peyote, and magic mushrooms. Heedless of warnings, they had risked everything and done it. Yet there was merit in their valor, their eagerness to find the extra dimensions of the self, to get beyond ordinary existence, even if they didn't know what the beyond was or whether they would ever return to the comfort of the ordinary. Nonetheless, whatever truth they had found, they remained unfulfilled. And whatever worlds they had reached, these young psychedelic voyagers had always returned to the Lower East Side. Now they were sampling the Hare Krishna mantra. When the Kirtan suddenly sprang up from the Swami's symbols and sonorous voice, they immediately felt that it was going to be something far out. Here was another chance to trip out, and willingly, willingly they began to flow with it. They would surrender their minds and explore the limits of the chanting for all it was worth. Most of them had already associated the mantra with the mystical Upanishads and Gita, which had called out to them in words of mystery, eternal spirit, negating illusion. But whatever it is, this Indian mantra, let it come, they thought. Let its waves carry us far and high. Let's take it and let the effects come. Whatever the price, let it come. The chanting seemed simple and natural enough. It was sweet and wasn't going to harm anyone. It was, in its own way, far out. As Prabhupada chanted in his own inner ecstasy, he observed his motley congregation. He was breaking ground in a new land now. As the hand symbols rang, 
the call and response of the Hare Krishna mantra swelled, filling the evening. Some neighbours were annoyed. Puerto Rican children, enchanted, appeared at the window, the door and window, looking. Twilight came. Exotic it was, yet anyone could see that a Swami was raising an ancient prayer in praise of God. This wasn't rock or jazz. He was a holy man, a Swami, making a public religious demonstration. But the combination was strange. An old Indian Swami chanting an ancient mantra with a storefront full of young American hippies singing along. Prabhupada sang on, his shaven head held high and tilted, his body trembling slightly with emotion. Confidently, he led the mantra, absorbed in pure devotion, and they responded. More passerby were drawn to the front window and open door. Some jeered, but the chanting was too strong. Within the sound of the kirtan, even the car horns were a faint staccato. The vibration of auto engines and the rumble of trucks continued, but in the distance now, unnoticed. Gathered under the dim electric light in the bare room, the group chanted after their leader, growing gradually from a feeble, hesitant chorus to an approximate harmony of voices. They continued clapping and chanting, putting into it whatever they could in hopes of discovering its secrets. This Swami was not simply giving some five-minute sample demonstration. For the moment, he was their leader, their guide in an unknown realm. Howard and Keith's little encounter with a kirtan in Calcutta had left them outsiders. The chanting had never before come like this, right in the middle of the Lower East Side, with a genuine Swami leading them. In their minds were psychedelic ambitions to see the face of God, fantasies and visions of Hindu teachings, and the presumption that it was all in personal light. Prabhupada had encountered a similar group on the Bowery, and he knew this group were experiencing this group wasn't experiencing the mantra in the proper disciplined reverence and knowledge. But he let them chant in their own way. In time, their submission to the spiritual sound, their purification, and their enlightenment and ecstasy in chanting and hearing Hare Krishna would come. He stopped the kirtan. The chanting had swept back the world, but now the Lower East Side rushed in again. The children at the door began to chatter and laugh. Cars and trucks made their, ru their rumblings heard once more, and a voice shouted from a nearby apartment demanding quiet. It was now past 7.30. Half an hour had elapsed. Now today we shall begin the fourth chapter, what Lord Krishna says to Arjuna. His lecture is very basic, and yet, for a restless youth, heavily philosophical. Some can't take it, and they rise rudely upon hearing Swami's first words, put, their shoes on, put on their shoes at the front door, and return to the street. Others had left as soon as they saw the singing was over. Still, this is his best group yet. A few of the Bowery congregation are present. The boys from Mott Street are here, and they're specifically looking for a guru. Many in the group have already read Bhagavad Gita, and they're not too proud to hear and admit that they didn't understand it. It's another hot and noisy July evening outside his door. Children are on summer vacation, and they stay out in the dark. They stay out on the street until dark. Nearby, a big dog is barking. Row, row, row. The traffic creates constant rumbling. Just outside the window, little girls are shrieking, and all this makes lecturing difficult. Yet despite the distraction of children, traffic, and dogs, he wants the door open. If it is closed, he says, why is it closed? People may come in. He continues undaunted, quoting Sanskrit, holding his audience, and developing his urgent message while the relentless cacophony rivals his every word. Would somebody else like to read? Yeah, I'll, I'll take over. Um, 
row, 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 eek, ya, shrieking like little Spanish witches. The girls disturb the whole black in the distance. A man shouts from his window, get out of here, get out of here, Prabhupada. Ask them not to make noise, Roy, one of the boys in the temple. The man is chasing the kids now, Prabhupada. Yes, yes, these children are making a, a disturbance. Ask them, Roy. Yes, that's what. The man's chasing them right now, Prabhupada. They are making noises, Roy. Yes, he's chasing them now. The man chases the children away, but they'll be back. You, ca you can't chase the children off the street. They live there, and the big dog never stops barking. And who will, sorry, and who can stop the cars? The cars are always there. Prabhupada uses the cars to give an example. When a car uh, momentarily comes into our vision on second interview, we certainly don't think that it's had no existence before we saw it all, that ceases to exist once it has passed the view. Similarly, when Krishna goes from this, planet to another he doesn't mean he no longer exists although he may appear that way actually his he has only left our sight krishna and his incarnations constantly appear and disappear on innumerable planets and from the innumerable universes of the material creation <clears throat> the cars always passing roaring and rumbling through every word Prabhupada speaks the door is open and he is poised at the edge of a river of carbon monoxide. As a part, rumbling tyres and constant waves of traffic he has come a long way from the banks of the Yamuna to, uh, sorry, in Vrindavan, where great saints and, and sages have gathered through the ages to discuss Krishna consciousness. But his audience lives here amid the scene, so he has come here. Beside second hand views, rushing river of traffic to speak loudly the ageless message. He is still stressing the same point. Whatever you do in Krishna consciousness, however little it may be, is eternally good for you. Yet now, more than uptown or on the Bowery, he is calling his hearers to take to Krishna consciousness fully and become devotees, he assures them. Anyone? I Anyone take over? <clears throat> Anyone can become a devotee and friend of Krishna, I told you. You will be surprised that Lord Chaitanya's principal disciples were also were all so-called fallen in society. He appointed Haridas Thakur to the highest position in the spiritual mission, although he happened to take birth in a Mohammedan family, so there is no bar for anyone. Everyone can become spiritual master, provided he knows the science of Krishna. This is the science of Krishna, this Bhagavad Gita, and if anyone knows it perfectly, then he becomes a spiritual master. And this transcendental vibration, Hare Krishna, will help us by cleaning the dust from the mirror of our mind. On the mind, we have accumulated material dust. Just like on the Second Avenue, due to the constant traffic of motor cars, there's always a creation of dust over everything. Similarly, by our manipulation of materialistic activities, there are some material dusts which are accumulated on the mind. And therefore, we are unable to see things in true perspective. So this process, the vibration of the transcendental sound, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, will, clean the, will cleanse the dust. And as soon as the dust is cleared, then as you see your fa nice face in the mirror, similarly you can see your real constitutional position, the spirit soul. In Sanskrit language, it is said, Baba Maha Dav Davagni. Lord Chaitanya said that. Lord Chaitanya's picture you have seen in the front window. He is dancing and chanting Hare Krishna. So it doesn't matter what a person was doing before, what sinful activities. A person may not be perfect at first, but if he is engaged in service, then he will be purified. Suddenly a Bowery derelict enters, whistling and drunkenly shouting. 
The audience remained seated, not knowing what to make of it. Drunk. How are you? I'll be right back. I bought another thing. Prabhupada. Don't disturb. Sit down. What? We are talking seriously. Drunk. I'll put it up here. Is it a church? All right. I'll be right back. The man is white-haired, with a short grizzly beard and frowsy clothing. His odour reeks through the temple, but then he suddenly careens out the door and it's gone. Prabhupada chuckles softly and returns immediately to his lecture. So, so it doesn't matter what a person was doing before, if he engages in Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, it should be concluded that he is the saint. He is a saintly person. Api Chet Su Dura Charo. Never mind if he may have some external immoral habit due to his past association. It doesn't matter. Somewhere or other, one should become Krishna conscious, and then gradually he will become a saintly person as he goes on executing this process of Krishna consciousness. There is a story about how habit is second nature. There was a thief, and he went on pilgrimage with some friends. So at night, when the others were sleeping, because his habit was to steal at night, he got up and was taking someone's baggage. But then he was thinking, oh, I have come to this holy place of pilgrimage, but still I am committing theft by habit. No, I shall not do it. So then he took someone's bag and put it in another's place. And for the whole night, the poor fellow moved the bags of the pilgrims from here to there. But due to his conscience, because he was on a holy pilgrimage, he did not actually take anything. So in the morning, when everyone got up, they looked around and said, where is my bag? I don't see it. And another man says, I don't see my bag. And then someone says, oh, there is your bag. So there was some row. So they thought, what is the matter? How has how has it so happened? Then the thief rose up and told all of the friends, my dear gentlemen, I am a thief by occupation. And because I have that habit to steal at night, I couldn't stop myself. But I thought, I've come to this holy place, so I won't do it. Therefore, I placed one person's bag in another man's place. Please excuse me. So this is habit. He doesn't want to, but he has a habit of doing it. He has decided not to commit theft anymore, but sometimes he does, habitually. So Krishna says that in such conditions, when one who has decided to stop all immoral habits and just take to this process of Krishna consciousness, if by chance he does something which is immoral in the face of society, that should not be taken account of. In the next verse, Krishna says, Shipram Bhavati Dharmatma, because he has dovetailed himself in Krishna consciousness, it is sure that he will be very saintly very soon. Suddenly, the old derelict returns, announcing his entrance. How are you? He is carrying something. He maneuvers his way through the group, straight to the back of the temple, where the Swami is sitting. He opens the toilet room door, puts two rolls of bathroom tissue inside, closes the door, and then turns to the sink, sits some paper towels on top of it, and puts two more rolls of bathroom tissue and some more paper towels under the sink. He then stands and turns around towards the Swami and the audience. The Swami is looking at him and asks, what is this? The bomb is silent now, he has done his work. Prabhupada begins to laugh, thanking his visitor, who is now moving toward the door. Thank you, thank you very much. The bomb exits. Just see, Prabhupada now addresses his congregation. It is a natural tendency to give some service. Just see, he is not in order. But he thought that, here is something, let me give some service. Just see how automatically it comes. This is natural. Uh, anyone else want to read, read a bit more? I can read. Uh, Mantra, do you want me to continue or did you want this time for reflection? I think a couple more pages and then there's a, a, a little we're break. We're halfway through the chapter. Yeah, and then, then we're halfway yeah. through. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Okay. The young men in the audience look at one another. This is really far out. First the chanting with the brass symbols, the Swami looking like Buddha and talking about Krishna and chanting. And now this crazy stuff with the bum. But the Swami stays cool. He's really cool. Just sitting on the floor like he's not afraid of anything. Just talking his philosophy about the soul and us becoming saints and even the old drunk becoming an, a saint. After almost an hour, the dog still barks and the kids still squeal. Prabhupada is asking his hearers, 
who are only beginners in spiritual life to become totally dedicated creatures of Krishna consciousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, you will find that anyone who preaches the gospel of Bhagavad Gita to the people of the world is the most dear, the dearest person to Krishna. Therefore, it is our, our duty to preach the principles of this Bhagavad Gita to make people Krishna conscious. Prabhupada can't wait to tell them, even if they aren't ready, it's too urgent. The world needs Krishna conscious preachers. People are suffering for want of Krishna consciousness. Therefore, each and every one of us should be engaged in the preaching work of Krishna consciousness for the benefit of the whole world. Lord Chaitanya, whose picture is in the front of our stall, has very nicely preached the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. The Lord says, just take my orders, all of you, and become a spiritual master. Lord Chaitanya gives the order that in every country you go and preach Krishna consciousness. So if we take up this missionary work to preach Bhagavad Gita as it is, without interpretation and without any material motives behind it, as it is, then Krishna says it shall be done. We should not have any attraction for worldly activities, otherwise we can't have Krishna. But it doesn't mean that we should be inimical to the people of the world. No, it is our duty to give them the highest instruction that you become Krishna conscious. And a young man in the audience seems unable to contain himself and begins making his own incoherent speech. Prabhupada, no, you cannot disturb just now. Man, standing up. Now, wait a minute, man. The quarrel begins as others try to quiet him. Prabhupada, no, 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 no. Not just now. No, no, you cannot ask just now. Man, well, I am trying to talk, Prabhupada, no, just now you cannot ask, man, but wait a minute, man, wait, Prabhupada, why do you interfere just now, we have a regular question time, others in the audience, let the man finish, yeah, let him talk, the man's supporters defend his right to speak while others try to silence him, second man, I have just one question please, how long is an individual allowed or expected to go on without any type of thought? How long? Prabhupada, I'm not finished. We'll give question time after finishing the talk. The parties go on quarrelling. All right, I'm very glad you are curious, but please wait. Have some patience, because we have not finished. As soon as we finish, after five minutes, ten minutes, I will tend to your question. Don't be impatient, sit down. The audience quiet, quiets down and the Swami goes on with his talk. After five minutes, Prabhupada, all right, this gentleman is impatient, we shall stop here. Now what is your question, sir? Man, practically we tend to place emphasis on those we identify with the fact itself. Many people are meant to explain the why falls and wherefores of the metaphysical truth that I think, therefore I am. Prabhupada, what is your particular question? Man, I have no answer to that question, rather, but that I attempt, I live, I breathe. Prabhupada, yes. Man, so ability, tell me why I have nothing to do with it. May I understand the why falls and where and where's? Prabhupada, that's all right. Man, I have difficulty in you. I have difficulty in saying, Prabhupada. Uh, so long as we are in this material world, there are so many problems. Man, not many problems. It is not many problems. This is the greatest fact I have. I know, Prabhupada, yes. Man, I also know that the whys and wherefores of my particular, Prabhupada, yes. Man, I didn't come here, but let me explain my position. This isn't necessarily, I feel I must. I think the difference is to learn. You'll find it innumerable times by the same token. Maybe we are able to reconcile the fact of individual being for a long time to find out why. Prabhupada turning to one of the boys. Roy, can you answer this question? It is a general question. You can answer, yes. Roy turns sympathetically to the rambling questioner and Prabhupada addresses his audience. Enough questions. 
His voice now seems tired and resigned. Let us have kirtan. And the Lower East Side once again abates. The chanting begins, the brass cymbals, Prabhupada's voice carrying the melody and the audience responding. It goes on for half an hour and then stops. It is nine. It is now nine. The audience sits before Swamiji while a boy brings him an apple, a small wooden bowl and a knife. As most of the audience still sits and watches, gauging the after effects of the chanting as though it had been some new drug, the Swami cuts the apple in half, then in fourths, then in eighths, until there are many pieces. He takes one himself and asks one of the boys to pass the bowl around. Swamiji holds back his head and deftly pops a slice of apple into his mouth without touching his fingers to his lips. He chews a bit, ruminating, his lips closed. The members of the congregation munch silently on little pieces of apple. Prabhupada stands, slips into his shoes and exits through the side door. Hare Krishna. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks everyone for reading. It's really nice, especially nice to hear James reading. Never heard him. Yeah. Never heard James speak before. We only see his face. Why don't we never heard Anthony either? Um, Krishna's coming. Anthony speak. These northern accents. We don't yeah. hear anyone. It's like nice that. having a good, good northern yeah. accent. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Wonderful. So I don't know if anybody's got any reflections, yeah, or comments or anything. Well, but if, in case I forget, mm -hmm. oh, Radha Priya is listening. She's possibly in Bath or maybe in London. She said thank you to everyone for reading. I noticed when uh, when Mara Manjaprabhu was reading just before the drunk guy came in, mm. Mara Manjaprabhu said cleansed. Mm. And then he corrected himself and said cleansed. And Parapad says cleansed. When you hear Parapad give class, <laughs> when he's giving lectures, Parapad says it like that. He says cleansed. <laughs> just made me think of that, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Sorry, Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. I was just um, thinking when they were talking about um, the hippies having like a little bit of um, religious thought about this and a little bit of that and it all being hodgepodge together. Um, I was thinking that my kind of beliefs um, over time have been quite similar like that and it's only when I um, started um, learning about Bhagavad Gita and other things through um, devotees and Srila Prabhupada obviously that um, things became clearer so I kind of identified with them to a certain extent. <laughs> I don't know how many of them continue to be devotees after it'd be interesting to know but um, yeah I kind of felt for them a bit really <laughs> so i think we all do that to a certain extent that we're kind of looking for answers yeah. Yeah. it's difficult when you don't have an authority yeah yeah and also my last spiritual community was a bit like that and it got to the point where it was so confusing because they were taking from lots of different religions and i was kind of getting a bit confused with it all and i, I know there's usually a seed of truth that um you know the essence of all religions of course a lot of them are saying the same thing but it just got for me a bit confusing so i hope some of them found their answers <laughs> yeah it'll be interesting reading on we'll see who who takes who makes it who takes to it yeah. and um, who later on you know go on to do big things for Prabhupada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's definitely some names in there that you recognise. Yeah, already some names have been dropped in. Yeah, you think, yeah. oh yeah, I know who that's going to be later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can, somehow or another, you know what their initiated name yeah. will be. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Radha Priya. Radha Priya just wrote. To, uh, wonderful to hear how Kirtan's first began in the West and to see how huge Kirtan now uh, is in the West. And also how, for me, it is everything. <laughs> yeah, I liked uh, reading that and how at first they were a bit hesitant, some of them, mm. um, and, uh, and how it builds up. I, it was nice reading that. Yeah. yeah. 
Nice. Very nice description. Everything so nicely written. Can Emily hear me? I heard that, yeah. Prabhu. Yeah, that was great. You heard that? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, the bit I was reading um, reminded me of my younger days as well. Uh, you know, when they were talking, Keith and Wally and Howard in the flat. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I used to live um, I used to live in London and it was like, in this two blocks of flats, it was like, there was like, um, it was like, you know, 60 squats, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, a crowd of us used to all go down the temple, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite good. We used to like um, talk about Krishna consciousness in the evening, and there'd be somebody there that lived that had lived in a temple for three years, and so um, it brought back memories, you know. Mm -hmm. It brought back memories of uh, my younger days um, uh, when we used to all go to Soho Street from these squats, you know. <laughs> We have yeah, it was. Um, I was just going to say we have friends in Margate, and there's children living squats mm. in London, and they all go and get prasadam from Parasharam now in Camden Town. So it's still yeah, happening. yeah. That was who comes to the programs here in Canterbury. She used to be in squats in London with some of the devotees who now live in Soho Street. Ah. <laughs> so it seems to be the entrance point for a fair go. few devotees. Yeah. It's the same. Well, uh, you know, yeah, Prasadam is a big attraction, you know. Yeah. I used to go to a squat. I didn't live in it, but I used to buy mushrooms from a guys in the squat. And they were, they were just on the next street to where we live now in Canterbury. I walked past their house all the time. And someone was but, on, um, they were selling uh, books during a marathon. It was very high. And this girl came up to me and gave me a book on the street. And uh, it was easy journey to other planets. But I just took one look at it and thought, oh, yeah, that, that looks good. <laughs> I'll have a bit of that. So I bought the book. <laughs> But it, the journey was a bit more difficult than I thought it would be, so I I couldn't get on with it straight away. But late, late, you know, ten years later or something, it was okay. But yeah, a lot of that really resonated with me as well. But, it's, mm -hmm. but it, it seemed like it. I don't know, maybe not. I remember talking to Jan and Maharaj once, and he was telling me about the '60s, and he was saying it was just like there was some magic in the air in the '60s. Not that we can't have a similar thing now, but he was saying there was just some, he said there was, it was a time like no other time. And the, he was sort of looking wistfully, you know, and he kind of just said, it will never happen again. But there was just something in the air at that, at, at that time. And uh, like that, it was uh, something special happening. Yeah, for sure. I heard, um, I heard this story about that man, um brought in the uh, toilet roll and uh, they um, put them in a wash hand basin. Right. Um, it's not in the book, so I'm not wasting the story. Well, as far as I know, it's not in the book, but he appeared back in the temple like a week later, you know, his trousers were ironed, his hair was combed, you know. Right. <laughs> he appeared at a kirtan, you know. Wow. Uh, there was one, yeah, there was one who was on very snap that the same guy appeared with his trousers ironed and all. Brilliant. <laughs> I was thinking that's also the that's also the beginning of a, a sort of ISKCON tradition. Definitely with like Namahatas. There's always, not always, but like now and again, someone will, someone like that will turn up at a program. You know, it's a guarantee, isn't it? Some guy will just walk in like that. It always happens now and again, you know. And everyone's sort of like, oh, what's going to happen? You know, like that. <laughs> give the guy prasad and let him chant, you know, sort of thing. It's not, it's, it was funny watching Parapar when he was distributing back to Godhead in Calcutta or Delhi, I think it was. And everybody was saying, oh, it's just like a real Sankatan devotee. He's going out trying to get a donation, hustling, you know, like trying to do big and trying to get, you know. And there's all these things that Parapar's doing and they're all like, 
for every devotee, it's that's part of your life now. Like you know, when it was saying that when he started the kirtan, sometimes after the kirtan left, people just got up and left, or they yeah. couldn't handle yeah, yeah. the talk. I was thinking, wow, that because you see that happen now. I was thinking, mm. wow, that even happened for Prabhupada, you know. Yeah, yeah. And also when he was um, talking about prasad and when he cut up the apple, yeah, and then yeah. they're all just sat eating their <laughs> little pieces of apple. I thought that was really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> As the thing for power party is there's no precedent. Is that for us? We if people get up and walk out halfway through a class, we we, we think oh that happened to power party. I've read, yeah, read about that. Or or we've know seen it's it. happening with other devotees. So power party just sat on his own, doesn't even know who these kids are. You know, like quite amazing actually. Just, just, I think that the people who who at the apple. Prabhuji, I don't think they realised how lucky it was. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, it was. You know, because that'll carry on in the other lives, won't it? In the later lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Taking, yeah. taking Maha from Parapad like that. Yeah. I mean, there's many a devotee that would have your arm off for a bit of that apple, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like gold dust. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and how kind Parapad is, you know? He'll mm. just, they're like total, you know, they're like less than chandelas. They're like, Maybe, but he just, yeah. you know, he doesn't think twice. He doesn't see it like that at all. Yeah. He doesn't think twice about it. He just gives them the prasad and yeah. get them the chant. Yeah, you're right. It's a yeah. nice scene, that whole thing. Yeah. Everyone munching on their bit of apple. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Yeah. Jai. I, mean, I don't know if anybody had any last, any other comments or anything. They wanted to share. Hi, Hare Krishna. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Thanks, everyone. That was really nice. Yeah, yeah. Thanks oh. again, to James and Anthony, for joining us. Nice to see you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really nice to hear everyone. Yeah, Jai. I, did, I didn't realise you had the you had the words there. That's why I haven't been for a few weeks as well. I didn't, I didn't. I thought you had to have the book. Yeah, I only just figured it out. One of the students in our university group. Yeah, we were, we were trying to do some. We were reading Krishna book with them, and uh, I got it. I was trying. I was trying to figure it out, and this, one of the students just showed me how to. Mm. It's actually quite an easy thing to do. So we do yeah. it every week now. So fantastic! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Thanks, fair. Thank yeah, Thanks, no pleasure. It's so nice to see you. I'm really glad to see you again. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to see you, Anthony. <laughs> um, very nice of you to take part. Great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. No, no. I think last time I seen you, you was in, in Scotland planting some flowers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Years ago, yeah. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you was in Manchester, actually. Was it? In the temple? Yeah. I think so, yeah. You were very hospitable. You were very, you made me feel very welcome and comfortable there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Brother G. <laughs> Hare Krishna. It's always everybody, all of the northern devotees. I'm always humble whenever I, whenever we, <laughs> whenever we see any of them or see them interact with each other or just hear them reading. I always think, oh, I'm so lost, so far to go in Krishna. <laughs> I love it. It's great. I love it. I'm not. It's not. A, it's not a downer. I, I love it. But I think, oh, we've got so much to learn. <laughs> so we're very honoured to have your association because it's, uh, you're an example to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jai. Shri the Power Pad Key. Jai. 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 Jai.